Good morning. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Today is Sunday, January 31st at 1130. The congregation will be having its annual meeting via Zoom. The meeting code is 517-543-1310. All are welcome to attend. The password is the year that the church was founded, which is 1851. Pastor Bruce would like to know the titles of songs that you and your beloved would call your song. Please send them to him with a sentence or two of what it means to you at his email address, Pastor Bruce at uccharlotte.org. Once again, that's Pastor Bruce at uccharlotte.org. Likewise, if you have a lullaby that you sang to a child of yours, please send that to him. He hopes to incorporate some of these into a service on Valentine's Day, February 14th. At the end of February, uh, we will be having a book discussion of Vice President Kamala Harris's book, The Truths We Hold, An American Journey. Details for this announcement, as well as other announcements, can be found in the Tuesday and Saturday emails that will be sent out from the church. Hear these words, for once you were darkness, but in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. We light our lamp thinking about our call to be children of light. We worship in the name of God, who we experience as creator, Christ, and spirit. Amen. As we enter into worship, we are reminded of the broad range of stories that exist in our sacred texts, where God's leaders engage with their political powers of the day. They do so filled with a vision of more holistic, justice-oriented world. Moses confronts Pharaoh and leads his people from slavery to freedom. Moses will then face many challenging moments as he both leads and teaches his people how to be God's people. Time and again, we encounter prophets as they speak to kings, queens, and those in power, reminding of the importance to not only provide for their own needs, but to care for the poor, the orphan, and the alien in their own land. Our Lord Jesus challenges religious rulers and those in power who have distorted God's law he calls for a more just and inclusive way of living where we act as peacemakers, speak out for truth, extend forgiveness, and recognize that God's love, that God's love is for all people and not a chosen few. He will model the sharing of resources and loving the overlooked. Come, let us worship in the presence of a just, liberating, and inclusive God. Let us pray. God who calls us into community, be with each of us as individuals, as well as with us as a community. Amen.
Our first reading is Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Now during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait at tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with six others. They had these individuals stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. When the Congregationalists came to this country um, and began to found their churches, they founded their churches in a manner that very intentionally had the congregation and sanctuary being a place that was more than worship. The early churches um, were called meeting houses. Um, and I know that sometimes we'll talk about going to meeting as the sense of going to church. But the Congregationalists, when they established their meeting houses, were really thinking it of a, as being a place that was about meeting and having meetings and gatherings. Sunday morning would have been about worship and worshiping God. Um, the service would have been a fairly long one, a break for lunch, and then sometimes coming back and engaging. Um, if there was a second part of the service after lunch, it was very much understood that it was a time where there would be some discourse and dialogue taking place. But between Sunday and the balance of the week, or the rest of the week, it was often a place where government took place, um, other civic gatherings and groups gathered and had their meetings, and so, you know, if you looked at the meeting house as being a place of life in the life of the church, you had six days where non-religious activities often took place within the walls. So it was not unusual that on a Sunday morning, the minister, and it was usually a he at that time, would um, often address some of the issues that were taking place within the community and speak to those issues. But being congregationalists, um, there was always the sense of that the minister was looked at and respected and held in very high regard, but people often still disagreed and had um, other views that they engaged with. I've decided to start in by standing in the pulpit of the church. Because if you went into those early congregationalist churches, what you had was a very high central pulpit. So literally the minister was on an eye level with a balcony and almost everyone who was part of the congregation was looking up. The pulpit was very simple. At the base of the pulpit would have been a communion table because the gathering was around the table and hearing the word. Beyond these two items and the open Bible, you had very little in the way of ornamentation. On the communion table probably would have been um, the chalice and the plate. Um, again, referencing the gathering for communion. If you looked at the windows, the windows were plain and simple. We have since um, brought in stained glass windows into our church. We have made all kinds of modifications in our church. We've introduced the altar um, into our church. Um, we have introduced the organ. We have symbols gathered around us. But in that early church, it was very much about the sense of hearing the word and engaging as the people of God that were part of the community. 
part of the reason why the windows were clear glass windows was so that you could see the world out there and that reminder that while for worship we might be stepping away for a brief period of time, we were still interconnected with the wider world. The word would have come from the pulpit and then the word was meant to talk to people and to be used by people as they went about their everyday life. I wanna share with you the passage for the day and then I'm gonna again step back into thinking about those early congregationalists. The passage for the day comes from the very beginning of Jesus's ministry. Let's remember what's taking place in Mark's gospel. In Mark's gospel, Jesus has just been baptized by John. He goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He comes out, begins to preach, immediately calls his first disciples. They responded. And then he goes to synagogue. He goes to worship. Um, it literally is this order of events. So here's the story of Jesus in synagogue. Um, where he's engaging with people. And what we need to be aware of when you are in synagogue, in worship, in synagogue, there was much more of a sense of dialogue that took place in the days of Jesus than we often think of in our own worship service. Part of why the teacher would read and then sit down is that there was understood that there might be a give and take that takes place. So after Jesus calls James and John and Simon and Andrew, they went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of the man. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him and they were all amazed and they kept on asking one another what is this a new teaching he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him and at once jesus's fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of galilee now part of where I find myself looking at this passage and thinking about this passage is that at the heart of it is that there is something about Jesus's teaching that is unique and different. It's why the story is being told. They are astounded as teaching for he is teaching as one having authority. There is something different and it comes back at the and again, they are again amazed and astounded at his teaching. So what is it? What's different about his teaching? What makes his teaching so unique that this is the first thing that begins to spread throughout the region? And I don't have an exclusive or conclusive answer to that. I just know that we don't very often engage with that particular question when we look at this particular healing. We usually look at it as a miracle and as a healing and don't see that it is being lifted up as a story that talks about something different. Now, one of the thoughts that I personally have, and I think this comes somewhat close to the truth, is that I suspect Jesus is teaching about being a positive difference in the world 
and showing tolerance and acceptance for other people, showing love for individuals who may be different or broken. You know, it's easy to talk about this. How do you embrace the person who's obnoxious, who is um, a disruptive personality? Well, you know, we talk about it, but we don't always do it. So the minute someone disruptive starts to take place, we give orders for that person to be removed. Well, in this particular story, I suspect this is what Jesus is doing. He's talking. He's talking the talk that we often hear him talking about and we will pass on to other people. And then in the midst of this, there is this individual who suddenly cries out, makes himself disruptive, begins pointing his finger at Jesus and saying, I, what, why are you here? Get out of here. You're disruptive. Well, Jesus engages. He doesn't have him thrown out. Jesus engages, and a miracle happens. We don't know exactly what happens. We simply know that in the process of the miracle, this disruptive personality stops being disruptive. Engagement. And that's part of why I chose to go in the direction of talking and thinking politically this day, because very much it's a day about engaging. Engaging and remembering that it is part of our work as people of faith to engage with others who might be divisive, might be different, might have different answers, different solutions. The answer is not to send them out of the room. It's also not to tolerate any behavior because Jesus doesn't tolerate the shouting, but to engage. I found myself thinking about um, one of the churches I served in Poughkeepsie, New York. If you were to drive up to the church from the outside, you would same, see the same brick structure that we have right here. The two towers, um, you step into the sanctuary, there, I feel like I, uh, I'm in a carbon copy oftentimes. That particular church, when it was originally founded, was Presbyterian. Its early members, though, very quickly wanted to become engaged in the anti-slavery movement. And at that point in time, the Presbyterian Church did not allow for that particular position. So they, as a group of people, separated away and founded their church and joined with the Congregationalists as an anti-slavery church. Politics. Um, but it's also about social values um, and engaging with the word and seeing how the word made a difference. When they made that transition, one of the requirements of those who signed their charter became members was that they had to sign a document saying that they were anti-slavery. So there you have a church very clearly establishing itself um, with a definite political tie. And guess what? This church, I think, has a fairly similar history about connecting and being identified as an anti-slavery church. Well, one of the church members of that Poughkeepsie congregation that always intrigued me was an individual by the name of Samuel Morse. You may be more familiar with the code he created, the Morse code, the early telegraph. He was a, a very prominent individual who was an inventor um, and had broad range. So Samuel Morse joins the First Congregational Church of Poughkeepsie. Well, when you dig more into who Samuel Morse was, among his friendships were a lot of slave owners. He had a lot of sympathy for slave owners. Now, I don't agree with that. 
I think that was wrong. And yet Samuel Morse felt he could be part of a church with which he disagreed with. And the church felt that he could still be a member even though they did not always agree with who he was and what he was about. Realm, because we are called to be a part of the world and to speak to the world and to raise issues to the world, and then in particular to be concerned for those who um, may be less fortunate or not have as much of a voice. So how can we be a part of a force for a better world? But also, how can we engage, be a part of engaging with others who are different and recognizing that as God's people, you don't have to agree with me and I don't have to agree with you, but we can still be a people together, speaking out together. Well, as part of the message for the day, I wanted to um, have an encounter with one of the representatives of our community in local politics. I am here with Representative Angela Whitwer. We have this wonderful view of our state house behind her, a place where um, we know a lot of good things take place, and once in a while where we hear some stories about some things that um, well, aren't so pleasant, but we're not here for the unpleasant side of things. We're here really to hear about how Representative Whitwer goes about um, engaging with all peoples and serving all peoples. I have a couple questions. Um, Representative Whitwer, as a leader in your community, when were you in an uncomfortable situation and were able to assist with diffusing that situation? How did you go about it? And how might such apply to present realities? Well, thank you for the question. Um, so I have a couple of different things. I worked at Sparrow for 22 years and I served a, a few different roles. I worked on the clinical side and then I worked on the um, administrative side. and. Um, when we were talking earlier, we were talking about a, a child that we saw in the pediatric rehab department, and he had terminal cancer. Um, it's, it's been easily 25 years ago since this happened, and he was 10 at the time, and his father shaved his head, much like you see a lot in the news, but it was pre-times when people did that, and his dad shaved a big T in his hair, and um, I became really close with most of the families that came through the door, and this family asked me to sit with them when Tommy was admitted to, um, and, he, and he was obviously very ill, and his parents called and asked me to sit with them when he was dying. And his dad um, was talking to Tommy about that it was time for him to cross and grab Jesus's hand and go on um, with him. And for me, um, it was a super uncomfortable time, and you spend a lot of time in the hospital settings both with patients, but then with doctors and nurses. And, and it's a high stress area because of um, you're, you don't go to the hospital for most happy times. You go for a babies, but other than that, it's not usually a, a great time. So I always made um, room in my heart and to be able to sit with people like Tommy's mom and dad and Tommy. I wanted to be there with him when um, he left this earth and it was, important to his parents and it was important to Tommy that I was there and I, I wanted to be I wanted to be there in my heart but it was we all have a side of us that it's hard it's hard to face really uncomfortable times and that was a super uncomfortable time for me because I had to watch two parents lose this precious precious child that um, brought joy to my life and I wasn't even their mom his mom and then um, most of you know I spent some time, uh, about six years actually, on um, Waverly School Board, and we um, we had I had so many good times, and I was one of the board members that would spend time in the school with the teachers. But during that time, the state had passed all these laws about um, evaluations for teachers and um, tying their their pay to their evaluation, which is a very difficult thing to do because 
teachers don't get to pick their children that they have every year. They don't know if the kids are going to be able to pass classes. And it's just a very difficult um, piece of legislation for our public school teachers. So um, the teachers were angry about it, and, and rightfully so. And so um, there was a lot of unhappy teachers, a lot of unhappy parents. There were unhappy children, um, students. And then there were only seven board members. But the board members, even though we don't negotiate the contract, we don't do anything like that, um, we did take a brunt of the unhappiness from the people in the community and it was difficult so i spent a lot of time listening and i and i did things i listened to the teachers and at the time we um you're encouraged to just stay away from it because you're not part of um, the negotiations but it was important to me to be able to listen to the teachers and try to bring solutions to the table that would work for both sides of this situation and I did that and we ended up with a really good contract and I am very good friends. In fact, some of the teachers attended my um, swearing in ceremony when I first was elected. Um, the te the, actually the union contract, um, the union president for our school district, Waverly, um, came to my swearing in ceremony because he ended up being such a good friend because we, I did just, I spent time listening to their needs and to the students' needs. Thank you. Um, as we move forward and think about current um, political environments, where it seems like um, we have a lot of representation taking place, where there are individuals who seem to be serving one group of people, but not all the people. Um, how do you go about representing a part of Michigan with a broad range of beliefs? How do you represent all of the people, while also at the same time being true to your own core values. So, um, so first of all, most people may not know that Eaton County is um, sort of a bellwether county for the whole state of Michigan. It's a it's a straight fifty fifty district, um, and so either side of the aisle could win, and um, it is. It's also one of the one, number one or number two of the most targeted seats in the state house for both both parties. But another thing I want to address is the fact that we do have um, a, there's there's a lot of loud voices, but those loud voices are actually only a very small percentage of all of our communities. Um, the Speaker of the House right now is a Republican, and I sit in the Democratic Party. The Speaker and I text re regularly. The Speaker is a man of honor. And is then this, and I have a meeting next week with the Speaker, and I plan on being able to work closely um, with him. He is a, is a good man from northern Michigan, and I, um, I, I think that we hear a lot, uh, a lot of news stories, a lot of things, but really, the majority of us get along really well. And um, I share Eaton County, a small sliver out of it is with Sarah Leitner. She and I are very close friends. She sits in the opposite party, um, but we speak all the time together. We, we cover the same you know, universe and we wanna, we wanna stay open-minded. So during this time, I, I say it all the time, this is not my vote. When I come to the State House, I do have a set of core values. I was raised by two very faith-filled parents, and um, you know, I was I was raised in a very, very, very tight family. But but my values may not align with everything that is in the district, and I represent all of you. So I make calls. I I, bec I bec have become a fat piece of the fabric of our community. I listen to people. Um, I call people back when people call the office and they want to talk to their representative. They don't want to talk to um, Chelsea and Sophia sometimes. They want to talk to me. I call them and it's not normal. Um, but I make sure that people know that I'm here for them, not for one person, not for one party, for everybody because everyone deserves to be heard. And a good example is agriculture. I, um, some of my closest friends are farmers. And um, now they weren't, they have become my closest friends because I turn to them when there's an egg issue. I sit on agriculture committee in the state house and I wanna be able to vote the way our farmers need me to vote because they give us our food and they give our food banks food and they do a lot for our communities and they're, 
and they're good, hard workers, but they lean more conservative generally than the party I sit in. It doesn't matter to me. They need me to vote a certain way and I vote for them. And I am a little different than most people. I believe we should work together. I believe we should be bipartisan and it's very important to me. I think it's very important to our community and they've said that. And I want to always be here for all people, not just for one set of people. Thank you again for taking time, for sharing with us, and we wish you a blessing on the balance of your day and for your continued service. Thank you so much. I appreciate this opportunity to engage with Representative Whitwer. I'm not intending for this to come across as um, an endorsement despite the fact that um, I do respect her and respect her profoundly. Um, I appreciated the time she joined us for a worship service this past summer and the conversation that we were able to have after worship. I've appreciated the fact that um, she is a spiritual person and I think this came across in her talking and that she has values um, that she has been involved in health care and education and directly connected with trying to make for a better world. I think this is what we're all called to do. We're called to try to make for a better world. This is Jesus's call to us um, and Jesus wants us to engage with the world and to be a difference. I suspect over time I will be able to work with someone like Representative Whitwer in a positive way um, and we will be in agreement most of the time. But I also suspect that there will be times that um, she will have one view and I will have another. But even in those points in time, we will be able to treat one another with respect because what I also learned about her is that as an individual, she really wants this to be a better world and that she has a genuine desire for people to connect and that when there's differences we walk the walk together for the the world is full of complex problems not simple ones and where it starts by solving is by our learning to respect each other but also, as people of faith, we're reminded that we are to bring our faith, our values, together um, as we engage with our world, because Jesus really does call us to go forth and to be the salt and light of the world. Amen. Prayer concerns and celebrations are listed in the Saturday MailChimp email that we send out. We do lift up these individuals in prayer throughout the week. As we prepare to enter a more formal time of prayer together, I would especially ask you to be lifting up your church, 
For today, we have our annual meeting as we reflect on the past and think into the future. To pray for your church that we might be alive and that the Spirit would fill us and that we would receive the direction we need. Let us pause in a time of quiet prayer. O God, speak to us. Speak to us that we might hear your word as a faith community, that we might be your body alive. Speak to those who would be our leaders in our community, that each one might be reminded that they serve all, and all means all people and all creation. Bring guidance and wisdom, patience, tolerance, understanding. Be with ourselves, that each of us might have your guidance and your direction. But then also be with those who are more vulnerable in life. Whether that vulnerability has come about because of weakness in their bodies, struggle with emotions and depression, the challenges of uncertainty, the feelings of victimhood. Come and bring your healing, your strength, your direction, your guidance, your love. And again, back to us as individuals. Enfold each one that each of us might know we are loved and cared for, and if each of us might have what we need to live life fully. And hear us as we pray, as your Son taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give you thanks for the gifts you have given for the work of your church. Whether you've sent them through the mail, your bank has sent them, you've come in person or sent them through another person. Thank you. They do make a difference as your church strives to be salt and light for this community. But also thank you for the gifts you give to the broader community to make for the whole world being a better place. As we prepare to go forth into the world, go forth and engage. Engage with the world and be the salt and the light that the world needs as each of us hears God's call to make for a better world. And remember the commission of our church. Our church will provide a place and direction for joining with God, healing the broken, educating youth and adults. We are challenged by our faith to reach out to our congregants, our community and our world family and to offer opportunities for spiritual growth and renewal. We welcome all into our Christian family. This is our mission as a church of Jesus Christ. And may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen.
week around church, there's been some strange sightings. In my office, I have found a groundhog. Um, I discovered that her name is Deborah, and she's rather fierce looking and seems somewhat like a prophet. But then I came over to church and I noticed something up on the altar. And I want to show you what I found up here on the altar. It's another groundhog. Looks much sweeter, much nicer. I think his name is Jeremiah. And you know about groundhogs, they are the prophets, prophets of spring. Oh, wait a minute. I've been talking kind of loud here. It says, shh, sleeping. Please awaken February 2 after sunrise. No, no, 10 a.m. Noon. He must really be a sleepy head. But oh, isn't he sweet looking? Look at this sweet little groundhog. I'm sure on February 2nd, he will have a good prophecy for me. Sleep well, little Jeremiah. Sleep well and pleasant dreams.